there's a way to make an entrance. <laughs> My destiny. It was now a conspiracy of witches. By the early 1990s, the Space Shuttle was changing the nature of missions to low Earth orbit, but an important part of its new role seemed to be fixing mistakes in sloppy satellite construction. Around the time that the orbiter Discovery had returned from its mission to deploy the Hubble Space Telescope, it was becoming apparent that while the mission had been a success, the telescope was a failure. A manufacturing error had been made and its images were blurred. Almost immediately, astronomers and engineers began formulating a repair mission. In principle, an optical correction could be made and fitted to the telescope, but nobody was sure if this was a practical idea. At this time, work on a new shuttle to replace the lost Challenger was nearing completion. Its first mission would also be a repair operation. In 1990, the communications satellite Intelsat 6 had been left stranded in low Earth orbit. Endeavour's crew would capture the satellite and attach a new booster to lift it to a geosynchronous orbit. They had been practicing in NASA's weightless training facility for 12 months before the mission. New equipment had been built for the specialist operation. Endeavour's first flight started in May 1992. The orbiter quickly caught up with the wayward Intelsat and the mission specialists began the operation they had spent so long rehearsing. The plan called for astronaut Pierre Thuort standing at the end of the robot arm to snag the $180 million satellite with a capture bar. But the slow rotation of the satellite made the task impossible and, as Thuot continued to grapple with it, he induced more complex motion along all three axes of the four-ton satellite. The attempt was abandoned and the orbiter backed off to a safe distance. After controllers on the ground had brought some degree of stability to the satellite, three astronauts entered the airlock and Commander Dan Brandenstein brought Endeavour close in to the Intelsat and skillfully mimicked its remaining rotation. Then, in a spacewalk lasting more than eight hours, the astronauts managed to grab the satellite with their gloved hands. This exercise had not been rehearsed and had been planned just hours before. The versatility of the shuttle and the ability it afforded its crew to rapidly adapt to real conditions saved the expensive satellite and added to the space transportation system's reputation for complex on-orbit tasks. After attaching a new booster and relaunching it, Intelsat performed for more than 20 years. But this first mission for Endeavour was still not over. A construction exercise designed to learn about building techniques in weightlessness was scheduled. NASA was keen to advance its space station concept. 
The main lesson from this exercise was that astronauts working with their feet securely anchored could carry out tasks in roughly the same time as they could in the ground-based simulator. But without a fixed anchor point, free floating astronauts use most of the time in bodily orientation and work times increased. This had been one of the Space Shuttle's most productive missions so far. If crews working from the shuttle could capture and relaunch Intelsat 6, then it might just be possible to repair the dysfunctional Hubble Space Telescope. Soon, technicians at the Goddard Space Flight Center began working on an optical fix for Hubble. They also designed a suite of specialist tools needed for repair of the space telescope. Engineers had to earn dive qualifications so they could work with mission specialists in the giant pool at the Johnson Space Center. Here, the repair procedures were devised, tested and then rehearsed. The four astronauts selected for the repair mission spent 11 months training in the underwater facility in Houston. In the pre-dawn hours of December the 2nd, 1993, Endeavour lifted off. It took the orbiter several days to catch up to Hubble, and the first thing the crew noticed was the buckle in one of the solar panels. Both panels were due for replacement, as they had induced unwanted vibration. Over the South Pacific, pilot Dick Covey manoeuvred Endeavour to within nine metres of the telescope. Swiss astronaut Claude Nicolier from the European Space Agency captured the telescope with the robot arm and eased it into the payload bay. There were five spacewalks scheduled to undertake the array of tasks needed to bring Hubble up to operational specifications. Story Musgrave and Jeff Hoffman began by replacing the two gyroscopic remote sensing units that enabled the telescope to point accurately. There were problems closing the compartment doors, but by working together, the astronauts managed to get them back in place. The next day, Catherine Thornton and Tom Akers prepared to replace the solar arrays. One would be brought back to Earth for examination, but the damaged panel was discarded above Eastern Africa. The shuttle gently moved away to prevent any collisions. When the new units were connected, the corrective optics package was installed. During the next three days, a range of different tasks were carried out, not only to bring the telescope up to its intended specifications, but to give it new capabilities. After each modification, the Space Telescope Operations Centre was able to verify the changes. NASA had completed one of the most challenging and complex missions ever attempted. The Hubble Space Telescope began delivering some of the most detailed visible light images ever seen. Its observations revolutionised our understanding of the universe. In the late 1980s, NASA had a problem. Confidence in the shuttle system had been shaken by the Challenger disaster. The space transportation system had been built as a stepping stone to something bigger, but NASA's plans for a space station had been starved of funds, and the shuttle's reason for existence remained unrealized. But in 1993, post-Soviet Russia and the United States signed an agreement on space cooperation. There had been a link-up between Apollo and Soyuz capsules in 1975, with the two craft coming together for 44 hours. But this had been largely symbolic. Now, post-Cold War Russia and the United States realised 
that they each had something that the other needed. Russia had Mir, a space station commenced in the Soviet era, but the country was strapped for funds. The US knew the Russians had expertise in orbiting outposts and they wanted to learn from their experience. America had money, but not enough for their own space station. The shuttle Mir program would serve as a bridge to something larger. In February 1995, Discovery rendezvoused but did not dock with Mir. It was the first shuttle to carry a female pilot, Eileen Collins. Over a four-year period, space shuttles made 11 flights to Mir and American astronauts spent seven residencies on board the Russian space station. Shuttles also conducted crew exchanges and delivered supplies and equipment. American astronauts began riding to orbit on Soyuz spacecraft, something that continues to this day. US astronaut Shannon Lucid spent 179 days on Mir, giving her the American record for longest duration single space flight. In the shuttle Mir program, Russia and America learned about long-term space flight and the building of orbital structures. They also learned about cooperation. But mistakes were made. In 1997, during Expedition 27, fire broke out when an oxygen generator overheated and later, during the same expedition, a supply ship crashed into the space station while attempting to dock. Damage was considerable. Parts of Mir were now 11 years old and with the knowledge gained during its operation, designers were certain they could build something better particularly if they could take advantage of the shuttle's unique abilities. Plans for space station freedom had morphed into a multinational collaboration on a replacement for Mir that would be known as the International Space Station. A memorandum of understanding between NASA and Rosavia Cosmos saw the International Space Station as a laboratory, observatory and factory in low Earth orbit. In November 1998, a Proton rocket carrying the first piece of the International Space Station blasted off from the Baikonur Cosmodrome. Known as Zarya, it was soon visited by the shuttle Endeavour that attached a second piece called the Unity Node. It was the first assembly mission. During the subsequent construction phase, most of the Russian components would dock automatically, while the American and European pieces were put in place by the shuttle's robotic arm. Shuttle crew specialists became on-orbit construction engineers, and these crews were now drawn from an international pool, with Russian cosmonauts riding to space alongside their European and American colleagues. Over a two-year period, the International Space Station began taking shape. In November 2000, a crew of two Russians and one American rode to orbit aboard a Russian Soyuz. Though the space station was only partially complete, the crew of three became the first people to take up residence on the ISS. Shuttles and Soyuz capsules visited regularly to add more pieces to the orbiting laboratory and to ferry in new supplies. A different type of astronaut was evolving. People were learning to live in space and not just make quick visits. At this time, not all shuttle flights were to the International Space Station. In January 2003, the Space Shuttle Columbia was being prepared for a science mission. The crew of seven would carry out a range of experiments for both NASA and the European Space Agency. It was the style of research that would ultimately be done on the ISS.
Columbia lifted off for a 16-day mission, but there were no spacewalks or other dangerous aspects scheduled, just hardcore science. For four of the crew, it was their first trip to space. And while they were enjoying weightlessness, engineers on the ground were reviewing tapes of the launch. A chunk of insulating foam had dislodged from the external tank and had hit the orbiter's left wing. There was nothing anyone could do, so the mission proceeded normally, while ground engineers hoped for the best. During the return to Earth, Columbia disappeared from tracking radar. At the same time in the skies above Texas, an explosion was heard and debris began raining down. Damage to the wing had been catastrophic and Columbia had broken up. Our nation shares in your sorrow and in your pride. And today we remember not only one moment of tragedy, but seven lives of great purpose and achievement. Before the morning had finished, the search for debris from Columbia had started. Though engineers had a reasonable idea of the cause of the disaster, they had to piece together every fragment of wreckage to fully understand the loss of Columbia. The shuttle would resume flying, but NASA experts made a recommendation about its future. It was announced by the president at NASA headquarters. Our first goal is to complete the International Space Station by 2010. We will finish what we have started. We will meet our obligations to our 15 international partners on this project. In 2010, the Space Shuttle, after nearly 30 years of duty, will be retired from service. In July 2005, after a hiatus of two and a half years, Discovery was being prepared for its return to space. During the break, redesign work had focused on the foam insulation covering the external tank. New safety procedures had been established. Flights would only go to the International Space Station where astronauts could wait if it was suspected that a shuttle had sustained damage and every stage of a shuttle's flight would be closely monitored. In 1988, Discovery had also flown the return to space mission after the loss of Challenger. Astronaut Eileen Collins would command the crew of eight. The mission would test on-orbit repair techniques as well as resupplying the International Space Station. Tension in the firing room was palpable. Though each shuttle had been designed for 100 missions, the Columbia Inquiry called the shuttle an aging spacecraft, with the odds of losing another orbiter and crew increasing with each flight. Upon arrival at the International Space Station, Discovery did a slow flip to allow the crew on the space station to inspect the craft for any damage to the thermal tiles. At launch, cameras had again picked up insulation foam breaking free from the external tank. This was not supposed to happen anymore, and although there had been no perceived impact, the new protocol called for all shuttles to perform this inspection manoeuvre. The craft also carried an extension to its robotic arm that allowed a camera to inspect all areas of the thermal protection system.
work on completion of the space station was stepped up. Previously planned scientific missions and a final servicing mission to the Hubble Space Telescope were all cancelled as being too high risk. With every mission now featuring long duration spacewalks, not just from the shuttle, but also by astronauts living on the International Space Station, training in NASA's neutral buoyancy laboratory became intense and NASA began referring to the period as the Wall of EVA. Mission specialists would spend years training for the specific tasks that they would have only one opportunity to execute. After Discovery's return to space mission, shuttle flights kept adding to the space station. But almost immediately, dissatisfaction began surfacing within America's scientific community. The Hubble Space Telescope was badly in need of fine guidance sensors new gyroscopes and batteries, and astronomers were putting pressure on their politicians to allow one last servicing mission to Hubble. In October 2006, NASA's new administrator, Michael Griffin, fudged the safety issue and announced a final repair mission to the Space Telescope. Three months later, the advanced survey camera Hubble's most heavily used instrument went dead. Work on the International Space Station began expanding the role of the shuttle. As well as performing most of the on-orbit construction, the shuttle was now ferrying Russian cosmonauts and European astronauts to and from the ISS, while Americans were riding to orbit on Russian Soyuz craft. the ISS began taking shape, with techniques pioneered on one mission becoming standard on the next. But a new mock-up had been installed in NASA's neutral buoyancy facility. Hubble repair became the focus of one crew destined to be the last to visit the space telescope. In May 2009, Atlantis headed for Hubble. After five spacewalks, the telescope had been completely refurbished and astronomy's most valuable instrument was back in business. In July 2011, Atlantis was the last shuttle to fly. It delivered supplies and spares to the ISS. After 12 days, Atlantis returned. It and the rest of the shuttle fleet are now museum pieces.